Last time, uh, we were giving examples of what might happen if one takes seriously that extraordinary 11th footnote in Wimsatt's The Intentional Fallacy, in which he says, the history of words after a poem was composed may well be relevant to the overall structure of the poem and should not be avoided owing simply to a scruple about intention. That's what essentially that's what Wimsatt says in the footnote. So I, I went back to the great creator raising his plastic arm and suggested that, well, maybe after all, there might be some good way of complicating the meaning of Akenside by suggesting that the modern anachronistic meaning of plastic would be relevant to the sense of the poem. This is, by the way, I mean, just, just because one can make this claim, and I think make it stick in certain cases, doesn't mean that the proposition is any less outrageous. I mean, just you know, <laughs> imagine a, a philologist being confronted with the idea that the meaning of words at a certain historical moment uh, isn't the only thing that matters <laughs> in understanding the meaning of a poem. Um, so I just wanted to give another example, a little closer to home, uh, of the poem of Yeats, 1935 poem Lapis Lazuli. I began talking about it. It's a poem which begins, I have heard that hysterical women say they are sick of the palate and fiddle bow of poets that are always gay. Now, this is a poem that, you know, the storm clouds of the approaching war are beginning to gather. Uh, a lot of people are saying, enough of this kind of, uh, you know, effete culture. Uh, we need to think about um, important things, uh, particularly about uh, politics and the social order. Uh, by the way, a very powerful <laughs> argument in 1935. But in any case, Yeats was on the other side of the controversy. Uh, and insisted, after all, that there is a continuing role for art, as indeed, on the other hand, there may well be. And he said, so he's, he's sick of everybody saying they don't want to talk about painting, they don't want to talk about music, and they don't want to talk about poets who are always gay. All right. So then the poem continues. Uh, it, involves, uh, it involves a stone, a piece of lapis lazuli uh, that, that, that has a kind of a flaw in it, which is like a watercourse and where one can imagine um, a pilgrim climbing uh, toward increased enlightenment. Uh, and as the poem goes on, Yeats talks about the way in which civilizations crumble, that is to say, all things fall apart. But then it's possible to build them back up. And he says, all things fall and are built again, and those that build them again are gay. Now, as I said last time, needless to say, Yeats was not aware of the anachronistic meaning that we may be tempted uh, to bring to bear on the poem. Yeats is thinking of Nietzsche. He's thinking of, 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 of a word, Fröhlich, which probably is perhaps best translated joyous. Uh, energetically joyous, uh, and uh, he is just borrowing that word from the translation of a book by Nietzsche. Well and good, but if you were a queer theorist or if you were interested in making uh, not a weak but a strong claim for uh, the importance of queerness in our literary tradition, you would be very tempted to say this enriches the poem. Not just, in other words, that they are energetically joyous as creators, but also that, in our contemporary sense of the word, they're gay. Right. Now, this, again, as in the case of Akenside, may or may not raise the hackles of the philologist. But there's a certain sense in which, from a certain point of view, it's difficult to deny that it doesn't lend a, cer that, 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 that it doesn't lend a certain coherence additionally complex coherence to the nature of the poem. All right, and then, you know, I mean, we have Tony the tow truck. You're probably beginning to wish I would refer to it, so why don't I? In the second line of Tony the tow truck, we learn, I live in a little yellow garage. Now, of course, the denotation as of, that, of the word yellow, as Cleanth Brooks would say, is that the garage is painted a certain color. 
The connotation, which undoubtedly the, the author had no notion of, wasn't thinking of, this is a book for toddlers, the connotation is that somehow or another there's the imputation of cowardice, possibly also the derogatory imputation of being Asian. Maybe Tony is Asian. Well, okay, well, you know, th this, has, this has nothing to do with the text, we say. And yet, at the same time, suppose it did. I mean, we could interrogate. It, we could interrogate the author psychoanalytically. We could say, "Hey, wait a minute. You know, okay. So you say it was painted yellow. Why don't you say it's painted some other color?" And we could begin to put a certain amount of pressure on the text, and possibly, as I say, begin to do things with it, um, which are a kind of five-finger exercise. And we'll be doing a lot more of that sort of thing, but which might work. All right, these are examples of the extraordinary implications of Wimsatt's 11th footnote. And also, I think, um, perhaps in advance of today's discussion, clarify to some extent the importance for critics of this kind of the notion of unity. In some ways, everything we have to say today will concern the idea of unity. In other words, a connotation is valuable and ought to be invoked, even if it's philologically incorrect, if it contributes to the unity, the complex building up of the unity of the literary text. If, on the other hand, it is what Gadamer would call a bad prejudice, that is to say, some aspect of my subjectivity that nothing could possibly be done with in thinking about and in interpreting the text, then you throw it out. So the criterion is, is it relevant to the unified form that we as critics are trying to realize in the text? And that criterion, as I say, not just for the sorts of, of semi-facetious readings we can do with Wimsatt's 11th footnote, but also for readings that may at least have some marginal plausibility, uh, this sense of unity is what governs interpretive decisions of this kind. All right, now a word or two about the antecedents of the new criticism. In the first place, the 30s and 40s uh, in the academic world bear witness to uh, a, the rise of a canon of taste largely introduced by the great modernist writers, particularly by T.S. Eliot. You may notice that Brooks, for example, has a kind of done obsession. He gets that from Eliot's essay, The Metaphysical Poets, uh, which is a review essay of a volume of Dun Dunn's poems edited by somebody named Grierson, which made Dunn overnight, for a great many readers, the central poet in the English tradition. Brooks is still, as I say, very much under the influence of this. Well, Eliot, in The Metaphysical Poets, says some rather interesting things that had far-reaching consequences for the new criticisms. He says, poetry in our own time, such is the complexity of the world we live in. Poetry must be difficult. He says, poetry has to reconcile all sorts of disparate experience. Reading Spinoza, the smell of cooking, the sound of the typewriter, all of this has to be yoked together in the imagery of a good poem, particularly of a metaphysical poem. And this model of complexity is what matters, both for modern literature and for literary criticism. Now, by the same token, other modernists like James Joyce are also contributing to this idea of the independent unity of the work of art. In Stephen Hero, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, you remember Stephen in his disquisition on form and Aquinas and all the rest of it argues that the work of art is something that is cut off from its creator because its creator withdraws from it uh, and, and simply pairs his fingernails in the, in the famous expression. Um, it's very interesting. You remember that, it, that in the Wimsatt that you read last time, Wimsatt argues, I think probably thinking about that passage in Joyce, that the work of art is cut off from its author at birth. This is an, this is an umbilical cord he's talking about. It has no more connection 
with its author from birth on and roams the world on its own. And so ideas like this, as I say, are taken from the aesthetic and Pra and, 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 and practical thinking about the nature of the work of art that one finds in modernism. In the meantime, the academic setting. In the 1930s, when Ransom in particular is writing his polemical manifestos, The New Criticism and the World's Body, and attacking most of what's going on as it's being done by his colleagues, he has two things in particular in mind. In the first place, old-fashioned philology, <laughs> the kind of, of thinking about the literary text that would insist that plastic means what it means in the 18th century. And, in the se and a lot of that was being done. This is the golden age of the consolidation of the literary profession. Editions are being created. The great learned journals are in their early phase. Knowledge is actually still being accumulated about the base, having to do with the basic facts of the literary tradition. That we didn't know a great deal about certain authors until this period of flourishing of philology in the very late 19th and early 20th century took hold and, in, in, and pretty much created for us the archive that we now use today in a variety of ways. So, Although the new critics were fed up with philological criticism, I don't mean to be condescending toward it or to suggest that it didn't play a crucially important role in the evolution of literary studies. Now, the other thing that was going on, and here, I don't know, depending on one's viewpoint, perhaps some measure of condescension might be in order, but these two were spectacular figures. The other thing that was going on was there was a vogue for what might be called appreciative teaching. That is, I mean, the, the contemporary and colleague of I.A. Richards at Cambridge was the famous Q, Sir Arthur Quiller Couch, whose, le whose, whose mesmerizing lectures um, had pr virtually no content at all. They were simply evocations, appreciative evocations of great works of literature. And I have to say that at Yale, exactly contemporary with Q, we had a similar figure, the person after whom Phelps Gate is named, the great William Lyon Phelps, who would enter the classroom, begin rapturously to quote Tennyson, would clasp his hands and say that it was really good stuff, uh, and, the students were so, and, and, and the students were so appreciative that they gave hundreds and thousands of dollars to the university uh, ever after. Um, th in other words, this is valuable teaching, <laughs> but, but, but again, you know, <laughs> But, but again, the new critics were fed up with it. This was the atmosphere they found themselves in. And what they wanted, and, and this anticipates the atmosphere that, that, that you'll, you'll see the Russian formalists found themselves in when we turn, them, turn to them next week, what they wanted was something like rigor or a scientific basis or some sort of set of principles that could actually be invoked so that the business of crit criticism could, be, could become more careful and systematic, less scattershot, less effusive, and so on. So this is, this is in effect, the backdrop uh, in which um, in the American Academy, uh, but influenced, as we'll now see, uh, by certain trends in the British Academy uh, arose in the 30s and in the 40s. All right. now. <coughs> The first figure I want to talk a little bit about, and the first figure whom you read in for today's assignment, is I. A. Richards. Richards, uh, before he became, uh, before he joined the English department at Cambridge, was actually a psychologist and trained as a Pavlovian psychologist. So that when you read uh, in his essay about stimuli and needs, uh, you see pretty much where you stand. It is, I mean, his sense of the way in which the mind reacts to the world, to its experience, the way in which uh, it's a, an uncomplicated reaction or a resisting reaction or a, an adjusting reaction, all has very much to do with Pavlovian principles. Uh, and these govern, to some extent, Richards's understanding of his vo even of his literary vocation um, during the period when he wrote, 1924, when he wrote Principles of Literary Criticism. For Richards, 
Reading is all about experience. That is to say, the way in which the mind is affected by what it reads. And so even though uh, his subject matter is literature, he's nevertheless constantly talking about human psychology. That is to say, what need is answered by literature, how the psyche responds to literature, what's good and bad about psychic responses, and so on. This is, uh, th 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 this is the intellectual focus, in other words, of Richards's work. Now, another thing, another aspect of his having been and continuing to be a scientist is that Richards really did believe, seriously believed, in reference, that is to say, in the way in which language really can hook onto the world. This verifiable and falsifiable statement is for Richards the essence of scientific practice, and he cares very much about that. That is, it's not, I mean, he does not, in other words, share with so many literary critics, perhaps even with Brooks, who follows him in making the fundamental distinction I'm about to describe. It, he does not share with the majority of literary critics and artists uh, a kind of distaste for science. I mean, he, and this, by the way, is also true of his student Empson, who was a math major before he became an English major. Both of them uh, take very seriously uh, a, the, the notion that there can be a scientific basis for what one does in English or in literary studies. So another aspect of it for Richards is, because he takes science so seriously, is that he actually reverses the idea that we talked about last time in Sidney and Kant and Coleridge and Wilde and Wimsatt. He actually reverses the idea that it's art that's autonomous. If you look on page 766 in the left-hand column, you'll find him saying, that science is autonomous. To de and what he means by that is that scientific facts can be described in statements without the need for any kind of psychological context or any dependency on the varieties of human need. It is autonomous in the sense that it is a pure, um, uncluttered, uh, and uninfluenced declaration of fact or falsehood. Then he says, to declare science autonomous is very different from subordinating all our activities to it, and here's where poetry comes in. It is merely to assert that so far as any body of references is undistorted, it belongs to science. It is not in the least to assert that no references may be distorted if advantage can thereby gained, be gained. And just as there are innumerable human activities which require undistorted references, scientific activities, if they are to be satisfied, so there are innumerable other human activities not less important which equally require distorted references or, more plainly, fictions. Here you see Richards's basic distinction between what he calls scientific statement and what he calls emotive statement. The distinction between, uh, between that which is truly referential, that which is incontrovertibly incontrover verifiable or falsifiable on the one hand, and that which is emotive. Later on, Richards changes his vocabulary, and he no longer talks about scientific and emotive language. He talks instead, even more dangerously from the standpoint of anybody who likes poetry, <laughs> he talks instead of statement meaning science, and pseudo-statement, <laughs> meaning poetry. I mean, you're really out on a limb if you're going to defend poetry, as Richards kept doing, as pseudo-statement. But of course, pseudo-statement is just another expression for what he calls here fiction. Now, why on earth, once we sort of settle into this vocabulary and once we get used to this clearly uh, unquestioningly scientific perspective, why on earth do you need pseudo-statement or fiction at all? We know very well, by the way, that there are scientists who simply cannot stand to read poetry because it's false. Right? You know, it's, I mean, it, it just as Richard says, you know, poetry, there's, so there, there, there's, there's always something kind of archaic or atavistic about poetic thinking. It's not just that it's not trying to tell the truth, as Sidney said, it, nothing lieth because it never affirmeth. Not just that it's not trying to tell the truth, it is, in fact, 
Sydney, uh, Richards goes so far as to say, following Plato, it is in fact lying. Poetry, poetry is constantly getting itself in trouble in, in all sorts of ways. Um, and the all, I mean, on page 768, for example, I know it's 768, although I can't find my reference in the lecture. See if I can see if I can find it in the book. Um, <coughs> It is evident, he says, at the top, sort of toward the top of the right-hand column, 768, it is evident that the bulk of poetry consists of statements which only the very foolish would think of attempting to verify. They are not the kinds of things which can be verified. Pack of lies. Pack, you know, I mean, and, and, and then we say, you know, it usually follows from this that somebody like this points out that Whereas we all know that, de that democratic society is the best society to live in, poetry prefers feudal society. It makes better poetry. And, wh whereas, we all, and, and whereas we all know uh, that the universe is of a certain kind, uh, we can't even call it Copernican anymore, poetry has this odd preference for Ptolemaic astronomy. <laughs> And you know, in, in other words, everything about poetry is atavistic. It's a throwback to some earlier way of thinking. There's some kind of latent primitivism in poetic thinking. Um, and Richard seems cheerfully to embrace this idea. That's what he means by fiction or pseudo statement. So why on earth do we want it? We want it, according to Richards, because it answers needs in our psychological makeup that science can't answer. In other words, we are, you know, a chaos of desires. Some of them are involve the desire for truth, that is to say, for what we can learn from science. But a great many of our desires have nothing to do with any notion of truth, but rather are needs that require fanciful or imaginative fulfillment, fulfillment of other kinds. And the reason this fulfillment is important and can be valued is, according to Richards, that these needs, unless they are organized, harmonized, so that they work together in what he sometimes calls a synthesis, can actually tear us apart. Literature is what can reconcile conflicting or opposing needs. And Richards cares so much about this basic idea that in another text, not in the text you've just read, he says, shockingly, poetry is capable of saving us. In other words, poetry is capable of doing now what religion used to do. Poetry, you remember, this is a scientist, poetry is no more true than religion, but it can perform the function of religion and is therefore capable of saving us. And so, even despite the seeming derogation of the very thing that he purports to be celebrating in books like The Principles of Literary Criticism, Richards does hold out an extraordinarily important feeling for the mission of poetry, to harmonize conflicting needs. That's the role of poetry, and that's what it does simply by evoking our wishes, our desires, irrespective of truth, in their complicated, chaotic form and synthesizing them organically into something that amounts to psychological peace, something that leaves us. It's a little bit like Aristotle's idea of catharsis, which can be understood in a variety of ways, but Milton at the end of Samson Agonistes understands it in one way when he says, now we have, as a result of this tragedy, calm of mind, all passion spent. That could be the motto to Richards's work. The experience of art, the experience of poetry, the reconciliation of conflicting needs results in a kind of catharsis, calm of mind, all passion spent. All right, now Richards had a student, an undergraduate student, William Emson, who had, as I say, been a math major, who decided he'd switch to English. He went to Richards and he said he had an idea about 
ambiguity. He said he thought, he thought there was quite a bit that could be written about it. Um, and so he wondered if Richards would mind if, if maybe he, he worked on that. Richards said, fine, fine, sounds terrific, uh, go do it. So a few months later, Empson brought him the manuscript of one of the greatest books of criticism in the 20th century and one of the most amazingly surprising, Seven Types of Ambiguity. The brief excerpt you have in your packet, I trust that you have picked it up by this time at Tycho, your photocopy packet. The brief excerpt you have from Empson is taken from Seven Types of Ambiguity. Um, I think Empson is the funniest uh, person who has ever written literary criticism. Uh, I think that his deadpan way of bringing things down to earth when they get a little too highfalutin uh, is, you know, so involves the skill of a genuine stand-up comic. Uh, his timing is perfect. Uh, he has, in other words, all the all the attributes of a great comic writer. Uh, I enjoyed reading him so much that when I was asked to write a book about him, I agreed to do so. Um, I've always been like that. I enjoyed that. Byron was the only person I enjoyed reading during the uh, nail-biting, intense period of studying for my orals. So I wrote my dissertation on Byron <laughs> as a result of that. Um, nothing complicated, no deep reason for doing these things. But Empson, I hope you enjoy. Uh, he's a page turner. Uh, and his extraordinary uh, brilliance as a critic uh, is really just part of the experience of reading him. Uh, I'm particularly uh, interested in the, in the excerpt you have in what he does with his notion of, because this is his way of responding to enthusiastic or appreciative criticism. One of the tricks of Q and Billy, Fe Billy Phelps and, uh, and, uh, and, and all the other sort of authors and lecturers in this mode was to say that they read for atmosphere, that, that there was something that one just felt along one's bloodstream or in the pulses when one encountered great literature. And their purpose as lecturers and as critics was to evoke the atmosphere of things. And so Amson says, well, you know, atmosphere, cer certainly that exists, and we can talk about it in all sorts of ways. Um, but after all, what is the use of atmosphere? What is the use of any aspect of literature if, as good scientists, we can't analyze it, if we can't somehow or another account for it, if there is atmosphere? In the passage I'm about to quote from Macbeth, it must be atmosphere of a certain kind and there for a certain reason. And what follows, it seems to me, is one of the most staggeringly beautiful, wonderful, amazing riffs uh, on a passage of literature that you can encounter. I'm sorry if I sound a little bit like Billy Phelps, but I do get, I, I, I do get excited. Um, uh, he, quotes, he, he quotes the passage from Macbeth, uh, as Empson says, uh, you know, the murderers have just left the room. and, and uh, Macbeth is sort of twiddling his thumbs, hoping it's getting dark because it's got to get dark before Banquo can be killed. So naturally, he looks out the window to see, <laughs> to, to see how the time is going. Um, and, uh, and this is what he says. Come, sealing night, scarf up the tender eye of pitiful day that with thy bloody and invisible hand cancel and tear to pieces that great bond that keeps us pale. Empson doesn't mention this word pale, but in juxtaposition with the crows and rooks, it strikes me that it itself uh, is an interesting moment in the passage. Light thickens, and the crow makes wing for the rookie wood. Empson italicizes that because while he has something to say about every part of the passage, which all good criticism, by the way, should do. You quote something, say something about all of it. <laughs> okay, uh, and, and, but, 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 <laughs> But, but, but Empson italicizes these particular lines because it's going to be the true focus of what he'll say later. Good things of day begin to droop and drowse while night's black agents to their praise do rouse. Thou marvelst at my words, but hold these... Lady Macbeth has come into the room. You know, so. Thou marvelst at my words, but hold these still. Things bad begun make strong themselves by ill. So prithee, go with me. All right, so Empson is fascinated by this passage, and then he, gi he, he gives you in the next few paragraphs the amazing variety of grounds for his fascination. Um, and he says, look, 
This is, this is what people mean when they talk about atmosphere. It's not just something you feel on your pulse, it's something that can be described, something that can be analyzed. And I just want to touch on the last part of it. He says, rooks live in a crowd and are mainly vegetarian. Emson's, <laughs> Emson's the person who says that, uh, that the ancient mariner shot the albatross because the crew was hungry. He points out that in the 1798 edition of the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, a biscuit worms had gotten into the hardtack. So naturally, he says, the particular kind of albatross that the mariner shot, I am told, makes a very tolerable broth. This is, <laughs> the, 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 this is the mode of William Emson. Uh, and, so, and, and so he begins here, rooks live in a crowd and are mainly vegetarian. Crow may be either another name for rook, especially when seen alone, or it may mean the solitary carrion crow. This subdued pun, this ambiguity, remember this is a book about ambiguity, this subdued pun is made to imply here that Macbeth, looking out of the window, is trying to see himself as a murderer and can only see himself as in the position of the crow, that his day of power now is closing, that he has to distinguish himself from the other rooks by a difference of name, rook crow, like the kingly title only, that he is anxious at bottom to be one with the other rooks, not to murder them, that he can no longer or that he may yet be united with the rookery, and that he is murdering Banquo in a forlorn attempt to obtain peace of mind. Well, I, I just, I'm not at all sure there's anything more to be said about that passage, which is that which, 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 which I think lays it to rest. And it does so by insisting on a complex mode of ambiguity that governs the past. Not atmosphere, sure, call it atmosphere if you like, as long as you're willing to subject it to verbal analysis, as long as you're willing to show how and why the atmosphere is exactly of the nature that it is, that it arises, in other words, and here is um, the relationship between Rich Richards and Emson, that it, that it arises out of a complex state of mind, that poetry, the poetry of this speaker, speaker slash murderer, that poetry is attempting desperately to reconcile, to harmonize, just as he is attempting desperately to be reconciled and harmonized with the society from which he has alienated himself, and of course failing. Macbeth is not Shakespeare. Shakespeare is representing poetry attempting to do something which in the immediate psychological circumstances it can't do. But in the process, evoking an extraordinary complexity of effort on the part of the mind to be reconciled through the medium of language. As I say, this is the sense in which Emson follows Richards. But at the same time, there's something rather different. Uh, between. First of all, Emson, Emson doesn't really kind of settle into a sense that it's all about the reader. That is to say, it's, it's, it's all about the reader's experience of the literary. Richards is actually an avatar of figures like Ezer, like uh, Hans Grover Jauss and Stanley Fish, whom we'll be discussing later in the syllabus, who are interested in reader response. That is to say, in the way in which we can talk about the structure of reader experience. Emson is sort of interested in that, and just as he's, th just as he's fascinated by the texture of, 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 of textual evidence itself, and he is also very interested, much more so, than Richards, and certainly more so than the new critics from whom he sharply diverges in advance in this respect. He's also much more interested in authorial intention. That is to say, for him, literary criticism is always an appeal to authorial attention. Mind you, he ascribes to authorial attention the most amazingly outrageous things that other critics uh, threw up their hands in despair about. But nevertheless, it is for him always still an appeal to authorial attention. At bottom, Emson doesn't really settle into the rigorous consideration of the author or of the text or of the reader as, as it were, separate functions 
For Empson, there's a kind of a fluid and easy movement back and forth between what, for hermeneutics, are three very different phenomena, author, text, reader. Um, for Empson, it's, it's, it's a kind of synthetic melange that appeal, that, that's ultimately an appeal to the author, but certainly involves both the working on the text itself and also understanding its effects on, on the reader. So all of this uh, distances Empson from Richards to a certain extent. But the most important difference, I think, between Empson and the other figures we're discussing, a difference which makes it even a little bit complex to say that he's a precursor of the new criticism, is that Empson very rarely concerns himself with the whole of a text. He isn't really interested in the unity of the poem. He's simply interested in saying as much as he can about certain local effects, certainly with the implication possibly that this has a bearing on our understanding of, let's say, the whole of Macbeth. But he doesn't set about doing a systematic reading of the whole of Macbeth. He always zooms in on something, thinks about it for a while, and then goes away and thinks about something else, leaving us to decide whether it has a genuine bearing on the entirety or on the literary wholeness or unity of Macbeth. Empson is interested in the complexity of local effects. And another thing to say about Empson's perspective, which makes him differ sharply, I think, from Richards and from the later new critics, is that Empson is perfectly willing to accommodate the idea that maybe, just as in the case of the psychology of Macbeth the character, that maybe poetry doesn't reconcile conflicting needs. Maybe, after all, poetry is, ex is an expression of the irreducible conflict of our needs. The, s the last chapter of Seven Types of Ambiguity, his seventh ambiguity, is actually, as Empson said, about some fundamental division in the writer's mind. There, you see, he diverges from his teacher, Richards. He's fascinated by the way in which literature doesn't unify opposites or reconcile needs, but leaves things as it found them, but exposed in all of their complexity. Paul de Man more than once invoked Empson as a precursor of deconstruction, not of the new criticism. And for this reason, for the reason that he's not concerned with unity and that he's not concerned with the idea of the reconciliation of opposites, Empson, I think, can rightly be understood as a pre precursor of deconstruction, because deconstruction follows the new criticism, of course, in being a mode of close reading. And there has never been a better close reader than Empson. But it needs to be said, before turning away from Empson, whose influence was widespread despite this divergence, it needs to be said that his purposes for close reading are actually very different from the purposes of the new, critis, new critics, the American new critics, particularly Brooks, whose preoccupation with unity is something he freely confesses uh, and something that, uh, well, uh, we've got 10 minutes, so I'm not going to, shouldn't, I shouldn't rush ahead prematurely, uh, something that you can see to be at the heart of what Brooks is doing. Now, here he, he Brooks, Brooks in The Well-Wrought Urn and Modern Poetry and the Tradition and the other books for which he's well known, uses a variety of different words to describe the way in which the complexity of literature is placed in the service of unification. In the essay you're reading here, he uses the word irony. He admits that maybe he stretches the word irony, but he tries to argue that the variety of effects that he focuses on in his essay uh, have to do with irony. In another great essay, the first, the first chapter of The Well-Wrought Urn, he talks about paradox. Obviously, these are related ideas. Uh, and elsewhere, he takes up other ways of evoking the way in which so complex feelings and thoughts are brought together. Um, Emson's word ambiguity uh, continues to play an important role in the work of the new criticism. And, uh, and it is, uh, at, at least it, it, it puts itself forward as a candidate to be an alternative term that one might use if one got tired of saying irony or 
paradox. Uh, there are a variety of words, in other words. Another word given by the poet critic Alan Tate, one of the founding figures of the new criticism, is pension. That is to say, the way in which uh, the literary text resolves uh, oppositions uh, um, uh, as a tension, that is, a, a holding in suspension of conflict, experience as tension. So there are these varieties of ways for describing what's going on in a text. It's interesting, I think, that if one thinks of Tony the tow truck, um, one can think of the, uh, the uh, when you go home and study it, you'll see what I mean. Uh, there's a complex pattern of imagery, as it were, between pulling and pushing. There's a tremendous amount of pulling and pushing that goes on in Tony the tow truck. We'll revert uh, to, especially to the notion of pushing in other contexts later in the course. But for the moment, you can see uh, the way in which there is a tension between that which pulls and that which pushes, which is one of the motive forces of the story. Uh, and that, I think, is an example also if, there is, if it is ironic that Tony is now stuck and instead of pulling needs to be pushed, if it is in some Brooksian sense ironic that that is the case, uh, we can understand that as irony or as tension or ambiguity. So in any case, uh, and now you know there's one way and there's one way in which Tony is probably not a good proof text for the new criticism. You remember that in my credo, the little the little uh, sort of uh, excerpt that you get at the beginning of the Brooks section in your anthology, Brooks says um, poetry should be about moral things, but it shouldn't point a moral. That is, and obviously you know uh, Tony the tow truck points a moral. Um, and so would be subject to a kind of devaluation on those grounds uh, by, by the new criticism, even though there are ways of reading Tony, as I've been suggesting, new critically. All right, now, <coughs> the ideal of unity for Brooks, for the new critics in general, is that it be complex, that it warp the statements of science, that it bring to bear attention between the denotation and the connotation of words. The word yellow in the second line of Tony the tow truck, its denotation is that it is a certain color, the color that Tony's garage has painted. The connotation I've suggested is of the variety of kinds that one might gingerly approach uh, in thinking uh, about complicating the texture of the story. Uh, in any case, uh, the tension between denotation and connotation is part of the way in which irony works. So the question again is, and the question it seems to me raised in advance by Emson is, why should these sorts of tension, these, these movements of, of complex reconciliation, result in unity? Uh, it's very interesting. Brooks is reading as she dwelt among uncommon ways, the wonderful Lucy poem by Wordsworth emphasizes the irony of the poem. Brooks feels that he's on very thin ice talking about Wordsworthian irony at all, but at the same time you know, does bring it out rather beautifully, talking about the irony of the poem uh, basically as the way in which you can't really say that Lucy can be a flower and a star simultaneously. She's a flower. She's perishable. She's half hidden. Uh, she's ultimately dead and in the ground, uh, whereas a star uh, would seem to be something that she just can't be mapped onto if she is this half-hidden thing. But at the same time, Brooks says, well, after all, she is a star to the speaker. And he's just saying, she's a star to me. She's a flower, half-hidden, uh, unnoticed to everyone else. And the relationship between the depth of the speaker's feeling and the obscurity of Lucy in the world is the irony that the speaker wants to lay hold of and that reconciles uh, what seem like disparate uh, facts in the poem. Well, now, I just want to point out that close reading can always be pushed farther. <laughs> That's the difficulty about close reading. You know? It's all very well to say, look at me. I'm reconciling harmonies. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm creating patterns. I'm, I'm showing the purpose of image clusters and all the rest of it. But if you keep doing it, what you have yoked together becomes unyoked again. 
it falls apart, or at least it threatens to do so. A contemporary of Brooks's named F.W. Bateson wrote an essay on this same poem, She Dwelt Among Untrodden Ways, in which he points out, this is the poem's on page 802, in which he points out that the poem is full of oxymorons, contradictions in terms, untrodden ways. A way is a path, but how can there be a path if it's not trodden? What, what is the meaning of an untrodden way? Or, in the, or the, should, there are none to praise her, but very few to love. Why, why call attention? Not so much to the difference between few lover and none praiser as the notion that none praise her. This is palpably false because here's the poet praising her, right? So what does he mean? None. Why is he calling attention, in other words, to this, this, this logical disparity? She lived unknown and few could know. How can she be unknown if few know anything about her? In other words, the poem is full of, not of, of complexities, but who says they're being reconciled? They're just sitting there oxymoronically, you know, not reconciling themselves at all. So Bateson's argument is that Wordsworth is calling attention to a, to a, a conflict of emotion or feeling that can't be reconciled. Hence the pathos of the ending, oh, the difference to me, and so on. And this, as I say, uh, is a different use of close reading. It's close reading which is not in the service of unity or of unification, but recognizes that the very arts whereby we see a thing as a unified whole can just as easily be put to the purpose of blasting it apart again. And of, and, and, and of calling our attention to that which can't be reconciled, just as the speaker can't be reconciled to the death of Lucy. Now, <clears throat> the new critics can, I think, be criticized for that reason, and the aftermath of the, the, the historical close reading aftermath of the new criticism does precisely that. The if if one sees deconstruction as a response to the new criticism, and it's not just that, as we'll see, it's a great many other things too, that response consists essentially in saying, look, you can't just arbitrarily tie a ribbon around something and say, aha, it's a unity, right? The ribbon comes off, <laughs> things fly apart, as the poet says, uh, and uh, it's not a unity after all. Uh, there is another aspect of the way in which the new criticism has been criticized for the last 40 or 50 years which needs to be touched on. The notion of autonomy, the notion of the freedom of the poem from any kind of dependence in the world is something that is very easy to undermine critically. Think of Brooks's analysis of Randall Gerald's Eighth Air Force. It concludes on the last page of the essay by saying, this is a poem about human nature, about human nature under stress, whether or not human nature is or is not good. And arguments of this kind, arguments of the kind set forth by the poem can make better citizens of us. In other words, the experience of reading poetry is not just an aesthetic experience. It's not just a question of private reconciliation of, of conflicting needs. It's a social experience on this view. And the social experience is intrinsically a conservative one. In other words, it insists on the need to balance opinions, to balance viewpoints, to balance needs precisely in a way which is, of course, uh, Im I implicitly a kind of social and political centrism. In other words, how can poetry on this view, how can literature be progressive? For that matter, how can it be reactionary? How, in other words, can it be put to political purposes if there's this underlying, this implicit centrism in this notion of reconciliation, harmonization, balance. And that is, has been a frequent uh, source of the criticism, of the new criticism uh, in its aftermath over the last 40 or 50 years. There's also the question of religion. There's a kind of implicit 
Episcopalian perspective that you see in Brooks's essay when he's talking about the Shakespeare poem, uh, in which, um, in which, under the aspect of eternity, inevitably things here on earth seem ironic, <laughs> and and there is always there's there's that play of thought uh, uh, throughout uh, the thinking of the new criticism as well. Naturally, one will think of things in ironic terms if one sees them from the perspective of the divine or of the eternal moment. 